Since the dawn of humanity, our ancient counterparts have used strength as a primary performance measurement, which has evolved into what we now know today as strength sports. But if we were to evaluate flexibility as a performance indicator, how would we do so? In this episode, I break down the six different positions that I think are worthy of being deemed the feats of range. Okay, thank you for joining me for another episode today. And part of me is uh, going to be really attached to this episode because in a way, the six expressions of flexibility that we're going to get into today define the journey that I took to develop the strongest and most flexible version of myself. So it's kind of been in the works for a long time, and I'm excited to just dive into uh, these movements, what they mean to me, and how I think they can be used as strong performance and indicators for flexibility measurement. So we're going to be kicking things off uh, with what I think most of you are assuming that I'm going to discuss, and that's the splits. And of the splits, we're going to discuss three different types, which will take up three of the six positions. That being said, stay tuned in the end for two honorable mentions that we should also consider for feats of range. Of the three splits, specifically, we're talking about the side split, the front split, and the pancake splits. Some of you may be familiar with one or two of these, or maybe all three, but let's take some time to actually review what these positions entail and things that we should consider in measuring their performance. So starting off with the side split, probably the most popular of all of them, Jean-Claude Van Damme style, legs between two 18-wheelers. <laughs> uh, this specifically is a measurement of our ability to abduct the legs out laterally as far as possible. But we can think of this in a way in progression sort of as the widest squat that you can obtain. And specific areas that need to have a high degree of flexibility are going to be all components of the adductor muscles. Uh, and what we're also going to be thinking about developing on the side splits is our ability to express rotation of the hips. Now, depending on what uh, or where you look to direction on training for the splits, the rotation of the hips may be very different. Uh, to abduct our legs as far as possible, we do need a very high degree of external rotation. But it's also t important to note that you can only actually abduct your legs so much. And this is where a lot of people actually get stuck in training for a side split because they don't know how to override these certain um, demands of the position to express a deeper range of motion. Now, one of the things to consider here in going further or changing the expression of rotation in side splits is internal rotation. And specifically when we seek more internal rotation from the hip at the degree of external rotation demands that we are moving to in a split, we need to consider the position of the pelvis. So the uh, training philosophies that I have followed specifically come from the teachings of Thomas Kerr's stretching scientifically. He wrote quite heavily about how to train for side splits for everybody. Uh, he talks about the position of the hips in an anterior pelvic tilt position, so it tilts back. And in order to do that, we need to express some flexion of the hips, and we need to also get into some internal rotation. So some of the mechanisms that we do see here in training splits this way help us override some of the barriers where some people feel like they may genetically be predisposed to not being able to do splits. Uh, which is, in my opinion, not the case for most people. So one book that I do recommend acquiring here is The Secret Methods of Acquiring External and Internal Mastery. So, I mean, this book dives, it's actually quite a simple read too. It dives into some of the trainings of the Shaolin monks, like many years ago, early 1900s. And literally the first uh, opening of the book is one of the monks in a split. He's in the splits. And the explanation of splits is the demonstration of the shape, the hieroglyph one. So kind of looks like a minus symbol. And one thing that is interesting in reading this too, though, is their thought process back then, and still I believe is one of the ways of thinking when it comes to training splits as well, 
is that he who is able to do the splits in the shape of hieroglyph one, so side split, should also be able to do the split in the shape of hieroglyph 10, which is like a plus sign. And that shape is actually turning into a front split, which is what we are gonna get into today. Um, as well, a little overview of that. So that is an interesting thought there is like, they would focus heavily on obtaining a side split, hieroglyph one position. And the assumption was that if you could get to that position, you would easily be able to rotate the hips into hieroglyph 10 front splits. So pretty cool book, lots of other interesting exercises. I mean, you can see that's the iron neck bridge here, like right after they talk about splits. So it's a, it's a good read if you're into flexibility. And to them, the measurement of flexibility was a feat that they took just as seriously as any measurement of strength. So a, definitely a good read for some of the things we're getting into uh, in this episode. And uh, it'll make for a nice reference for you to stay kind of focused into some of those things. So uh, before we do move on, though, we are talking about a side split. And when you train for a side split, you get very hyper fixed on obtaining just that, that side split. But there are other measurable targets along the way that you should consider. One being a horse stance. So again, another Shaolin style uh, pose or Kung Fu style, like it's in the martial arts scene pose. Obtaining great strength and flexibility in that stance is one target you should be considering for splits. The ability to demonstrate active control in a side split position with things like a straddle up. The ability to have that range of motion in a supine position. So we call it like a supine straddle splits where you're lying and the legs open up. Uh, developing a passive range of motion along with an active range of motion and ensuring that there is a good balance there within the two along way along the journey. So just some targets. I'll try to give you some different targets for all the feats there, but for split specifically, one that I am so ever passionate about, I do find that a lot of people do get lost in just hyper focusing on the splits position and not obtaining those measurable targets along the way that help you really create symmetry and strength in your flexibility. So we're moving on to the pancake split and the pancake split it can go relatively hand in hand with a side split because again, a measurement of an, a position where the legs are abducted, straddled outward, but the indication with a pancake split is that you're folding the torso down to the floor. Now this comes more from the gymnastics background as it is a very dominant range of motion that's used in expressions of movement such as handstand, um, other dynamic patterns, they really work extremely hard to have strong range of motion and compression strength, which is the ability to close yourself down through your flexibility in the pancake split. So uh, it does feed nicely into training for a side split. It gives you other things to work towards, but we're also looking at things like the mobility of the torso. And this is where the discussion to be had is kind of like, well, why should I train for pancake split if I'm obtaining a side split or what's really the benefit of a pancake split? And to me, it is the, the benefit of being in that seated straddle position. So you are again, demonstrating the ability to have the legs out straddled and to move your torso. So there can be this dynamic lateral movement, compressing the torso down. So you're, de you're demonstrating more of an active flexibility control in those end ranges. And it does bring in the inner hamstrings quite nicely to a lot of the abduction work. So it does provide symmetry in your programming. And if you approach it uh, in a way where it's progressive and measurable, it can just add good balance to a flexibility program where you can also hit some different targets. So what does a good pancake split entail? Now, thinking that we are folding the torso forward often gets people hyper-focused on the downward action of the pancake. But in order for us to be able to express qualities we're looking for in a pancake, which is gonna be of an anterior pelvic tilt of the pelvis so that we have the best expression of external rotation of the hip and of the groin, we wanna think more about reaching forward. So it is more of a reaching movement. So the spine fully lengthens itself out, which helps us facilitate the best pattern of the hips. Now being able to 
maintain these qualities may require you to work from an elevation. And again, similar to how we talked about the side split, having different targets, uh, things like a standing pancake position, an elevated pancake position. These are targets we want to identify along the way, and they're going to set us up for success for knowing that we're building that strong foundation moving forward. So moving on to the front split, and we're going to talk about a couple different types of front split. If you're familiar with a front split, uh, basically it's an expression of full range of motion with one leg out to the front and one leg behind you. And, you know, if we're specifically looking at flexibilities through the hip quad region and the hamstrings. Now there is a, a train of thought that the front split has to be squared with the hip. And this is one position. So the squared front split is with the rear hip in an internally rotated position. So it expresses the, the best line of tension and flexibility of the hip flexor. But the rotated out position is a martial arts split. And when we look at that position and flip it upside down, we can see that it very much uh, simulates a high kick type range of motion. Now, the problem with most people when training for split is they will focus so much on the rear leg being externally rotated out that they never will really tackle the flexibility of the hip flexors, which is one of the areas where most people do struggle in building flexibility. Um, so my recommendation for people, even if they are looking to obtain a martial arts split is just to ensure that you are training qualities of the side split and front split together with the squared intention of the front split. And once you do obtain a certain range of motion in that front split, you should be able to quite easily rotate that leg out and express that uh, martial arts type split. Other things to consider when we're training for a front split are how our torso is positioned. So for a lot of people when training for a front split, when the torso is completely upright, that is demonstrating the best position for a front split, but it may also hinder your ability in training for a front split because you haven't actually accessed that range of motion yet. So some people get hyper-focused on extending the upper body to try to get really tall when spending time in a low position can help you unlock a lot of range of motion as well. And we can basically, how I like to think of flexibility is the change in shape over time. So if the shape is a front split, a side split, what have you, we're looking for a shape change to occur over time and we're constantly measuring that. Now, if you do think of the front split itself as being an expression of one leg in the front and the back, we can similarly to how we talked about the side split being a really wide squat, we can think of it as being a really long lunge. So the long lunge position is an active expression of flexibility that can be trained um, quite available to beginners at almost any level. And you can start developing an exceeding range of motion in your active long range position right away. So another thing I really do like about front split, not a lot of people tackle the front split first. They go after the, the big one, right? The side split. But what I really like about the front split for someone that's looking to improve their flexibility is that it's very accessible and you will notice that you will improve upon a front split quite sooner than you may improve upon a side split. Most likely because the side split does require such a higher degree of conditioning and strength through those smaller muscle groups in the adductors. But in my experience, my own personal journey and with people that I've helped, the front split can see a lot of progression a lot sooner than some of the other big positions like the side split. And that's probably a good segue for us to actually talk about some timelines for splits before we move on to some of the other feats of range. My own personal timeline, uh, it took me 18 months to obtain a nice full squared front split position. So it's about a year and a half. And within that year and a half, I was training front splits very intentionally once a week. Sessions were about 45 minutes, maybe sometimes upwards to an hour as I started really buying into improving my flexibility. But I really devoted myself to training 
working on intensity and progressive overload in my flexibility. And when you do buy into that uh, train of thought with improving and training flexibility, it very much is the same as training uh, strength training. So improving these positions are quite similarly is the same as in putting more weight on the bar for a squat. So we do need time to recover. Once a week is actually plenty for me to get that front split. So the pancake split uh, took me about two years to obtain. And a lot of people actually I've found do recommend not training pancake split as much, like train your front split and your side split and pancake will come relatively easy afterwards. But I actually chose to train the pancake split for the entire duration of my flexibility journey for all those three split positions. And within that, I got it in two years training all three. So it came before a side split and I found that Ex expressing range of motion in that position gave me some waterfall effect in, in the others. So periods of time when my front split felt plateaued, putting a little more energy into my pancake split sessions helped the hips rotate or facilitate some different movement, or even if it was just breaking the mental barriers of frustration and putting that energy into my pancake split, I found that it really helped me. And the pancake split does carry over nicely to a lot of progressions for training a side split. A lot of the similarities are there. As you obtain a full pancake, you're able to then start exploring things like a straddle swim through where the legs actually straddle all the way around and back. Um, a full pancake split is defined as the chin, chest, and lower stomach abdominal area touching the ground. So I obtained that, uh, maybe my lower abdominal, my abdominal area was maybe a centimeter or so away from the ground, but there is some things to be said about the structure of an individual and how much range of motion they can demonstrate as well too, given uh, some of those barriers we put in place. So staying with the lower body theme, we're moving into number four. And number four is a feat of range that comes from the martial arts practice of wushu. So this is an ancient Chinese martial arts practice found in Western culture. And specifically, the head to toe is demonstrated by folding forward and touching your head to your toe. It can be done with your foot on the ground. It can be done with the foot up against the wall or even a tree. And this is basically an expression of flexibility that these martial artists work towards expressing so that they can have stronger stretch kick ability. So their practice is very much built around the, the ability to kick very high. Um, if you haven't seen highlights before on social media or anything like that of like how they practice, even when they show some of the younger kids practicing their kicks, it's absolutely insane because the leg comes way up overhead. And the head to toe practice, in my opinion, is very much a feat of range that showcases the ability to lengthen the hamstrings dynamically. So we could consider it a power exercise and also demonstrating the closing side strength of the leg. So the ability of the hip flexors and abdominal region to compress dynamically. When we're also looking for applications of certain types of flexibility, I believe that the head to toe stretch uh, really showcases what kind of things you can do programming wise with ballistic stretching. So ballistic stretching isn't practiced much in traditional uh, fitness settings and it's believed to be unsafe. Now, I don't believe that to be true. As with most things, I think the practice of anything incorrectly is unsafe. So if you practice heavy squats and no one's ever showed you how to do that, that's unsafe. Head to toe stretching introduces you to safe practices of ballistic stretching. So then you can start understanding um, speed of the pulses or movements in a stretch and how that can be increased over time. So maybe we're starting at, you know, 40 beats per minute speed to be moving on tempo and we increase to 60 beats per minute. So there's just a lot of ways that you can program and build around obtaining a head to toe. And you can learn a lot about the programming concepts of ballistic stretching. 
other things to consider for this one where it is quite a extreme starting point you already should have some foundation of flexibility in your hamstrings so good targets to work towards here would be things like having a forward fold with your palms to the floor quite easily legs nice and straight this would also be a good opportunity to look at why having a certain amount of strength in a Jefferson curl would be important. So if you're able to do 25% body weight for five reps and move through a full range of motion with your wrist passing your toe, that's like a good target to say, we're moving towards a head to toe kind of development. So not necessarily saying jump right in and start doing really aggressive ballistic stretching, but what you can realize, which is what I realized along the way, is obtaining some of these basic levels of flexibility can actually take you to a higher level of uh, advanced flexibility positions like a head to toe. So when I started that journey, there was no way in hell I thought that I would be able to obtain a head to toe. I couldn't even touch the ground. But as my flexibility improved and I started building this foundation, you start realizing what the potential is that's there and the head to toe practice can become a measurable target for you to actually work towards. And then just how I present it to students now, when they know what a head to toe is and what it requires, they kind of feel like they're training for that right at the start. They're obtaining a palms the floor forward fold and they know, oh man, like I can start training a head to toe at some point. So it becomes a lot more exciting to base your training around some of those principles. Head to toe for me, I didn't start practicing that until I obtained splits. I had established a foundation of a palms of floor uh, fold, uh, big strength in my Jefferson curl. And just as these other doors started opening, I started looking into this practice of head to toe stretching and stretch kicking and just wanted to see what I could obtain. I didn't follow a daily regime with head to toe practice, which some, a lot of the wushu practice, uh, methods just recommend getting up daily and practicing your head to toe. Uh, I just kind of stretched it out a little bit to one to two times a week, used it at the end of my flexibility sessions, uh, and just basically fit it in as needed. It came relatively quick for me after I attained all these other different, uh, markers of success. So within like three months or so, I was able to touch my head to my toe, but obviously two plus years of developing flexibility in all these other areas was kind of how the foundation went that way. So, so the, last, the last two feats of range that we're gonna discuss are upper body specific. We're gonna tag in those two honorable mentions, so make sure you stick around, but really honing in on these six. Uh, and specifically going into the upper body, when we think about how the upper body moves and expresses range of motion, it's, it does that in a way of pushing and pulling. And one of the best ways to uh, demonstrate the flexibility from a pulling standpoint, the ability to fully stretch out the entire upper body and see what kind of capacity it has in those end ranges is the German hang exercise. The German hang comes from the gymnastics world and a German hang is when you 360 around the rings, your arms are now stretched behind you and you're in a fully hang position expressing flexibility, not just of the lats, but of the biceps and pecs. So this is where we can take the foundations of hanging and hanging in and of itself is a loaded stretching exercise that expresses the flexibility of your lats and shoulders. And we can start actually exploring what capacities our shoulders have in that hanging position by moving towards targets like a German hang exercise. Certain things that we would want to consider in demonstrating what's considered a full German hang would be things like a full alignment of the body. So can the body actually align with the hips, shoulders, and feet in that reverse hanging position? And specifically with the rings, they give us some dynamic complexity where we can turn them out. So as we come around the rings, can we actually turn and rotate our hands out which can be further advanced into things like an in-locate where the shoulders actually completely rotate and they show you what they're actually capable of in a full end range. 
So lots of progressions can be had and targets can be worked on along the way. But number one, before we start working on extreme uh, hanging positions like a German hang, we got to be able to actually hang. <laughs> so it's a great starting point for individuals to understand uh, the importance of advanced positions will give you the importance of hanging. It's like, listen, your body's designed to actually move in these capacities in a hanging position and express range of motion. You should be able to hang passively on a bar for 60 seconds. You should be able to hang with one arm on a bar for 10 seconds. So when we're talking about flexibility, which hand in hand, flexibility is not just passive ranges of motion. It's developing strength through these end ranges. Hanging does that for us. So we can start progressing ourselves down the line and understand the importance of hang and build this really strong flexibility in the upper body. Things to consider when it does come to hanging. And one of the reasons why I do like talking about these two ranges of motion, expressions of range for upper body is that they basically bring the two primary movements of the shoulder together into one. So you think of the, the German hang, it's a, an extension and external rotation of the shoulder. So when building a flexibility type program, and we're thinking of how we can do something for the shoulders that highlights some of these main movements, categorizing things under a German hang makes it quite easy for us to think about how we can progress someone to a really high level of flexibility just within how we progress the shoulder extension and external rotation of the shoulder through some of these hanging postures, or even just some of these other exercises that you see where mobility training in and of itself gets pretty watered down sometimes. And like, how much do you need to do of something? Most of us just need to find intensity and get strong at it to improve that mobility. We don't necessarily need to do 30 mobility drills for shoulder extension and external rotation. You just need to have the right targets to work towards. So it really helps with that. So the last of the big six that I wanted to really highlight as good performance indicators for flexibility, to me, this is the mother of all of them because not only does it express range of motion in the upper body, but to be able to do this, you do need to have total expression of range through the upper and lower body. So it's really a total body movement and that's the back bridge. So to be able to perform a back bridge, we do need a degree of flexibility through shoulder flexion, but we need to have expression of extension of the spine, extension of the trunk. So we, the abdominal wall needs to be flexible. The hip flexors need to be flexible. Uh, we need to have an understanding of strength and extension because it's probably one of the most untrained uh, movements in the fitness world today. Everyone's back is debilitated, but no one extends their back. To me, it's the knees over toes concept for the lower back is that you, everyone tells you not to bend your back. You need to start learning how to bend your back. And that's one of the solutions I think to a lot of these ailments that people have. But let's break this down a little bit further. So the, the back bridge. So as we said here, right? So full extension of the spine, the trunk and shoulders, um, we're, we're also going to be need to need to be considering the flexibility of the lats. Cause now we're asking the lats to be in their fullest length to move into that extension. We do need strength at the wrist to be able to hold a bridge. So how you may want to categorize, uh, improving your mobility or flexibility through some of these areas can be all kind of put under this one movement, right? So T-spine, abs, shoulders, wrist, lats. Um, what we're looking to do here is to create an arc where there's no excessive bending, particularly through the low back. So this, when we do look at what a nice back bridge looks like, it does look like a pretty smooth arcing of the spine. So everything is extended, the chest is pushed through, shoulders stacked, legs straight. This was the hardest one for me to express, which it still is today. I'm not necessarily built to be super bendy in a bridge, but certainly I train those layers and I have gotten myself to a pretty good level of flexibility in a back bridge. And what we can also look at when we think of bending is its application in other sports. So things like combative sports like wrestling, 
they need to have a back bridge. They need to bend their spine. They get pushed and moved into that position all the time. Uh, and not only expressing that range of motion, but moving in that range of motion. So another avenue of martial arts, capoeira, where we see individuals expressing their movement and doing so in a back bridge position where they're rotating around and actually understanding what it's like to, to move into that back bend position. So you can, when you do start looking in these other areas that use back bending, throwers, another good example of the importance of spine extension and kind of full bending motions, you can start seeing where it's important lies. And like, who doesn't want to develop the power of a thrower? Like if you develop a strong back bridge, you're developing the power of a thrower. Like you're improving your movement options and your ability to really express power and flexibility. Thinking of targets along the way, like again, if that full back bridge is one that we want eventually, but it's not going to come right away. And one way of thinking is just to think of your shape evolving over time. So if the legs are bent and we're training the bridge in that capacity, if we're more in a mid position or low bridge position with the arms bent and we're building up those capacities, it's nice to break the bridge down in that way. We can also work towards targets where the feet are elevated. Now elevated bridge is one that you will see quite commonly prescribed, but the one thing I don't like necessarily about the elevated bridge focus too much is that the focus is to take away from training the low back. So take the stress off your low back with an elevated bridge. That shouldn't necessarily be the focus. If you want to develop a strong bridge, you should be choosing a, an elevated height that allows you to find a nice shoulder position, but still trains your back because your back does need to get strong to be able to do a bridge. So coming out of the back bend as our last feet of range of the big six, I wanted to, to discuss today. I want to now talk about some honorable mentions here, two specific honorable mentions that when uh, you hear me introduce them, you might think, oh, those are strength exercises. But in considering everything we just talked about, these expressions of range are all strength exercises. And we need to start looking at flexibility as a feat of strength. So feats of range, it does help us categorize what we are actually assessing in terms of what the feat is. It still is a feat of strength to develop it the way we had discussed. The first one of the honorable mentions is the old time bent press. The bent press used to be the primary lift that athletes would perform when strength training. And one of the reasons it got lost is because it requires a high degree of flexibility, specifically through the shoulder girdle to be externally rotated. The torso needs a ton of rotation and to do it the way they did it back then, you do need a high degree of flexibility through the hip, specifically uh, hamstrings as well. The old time technique isn't seen anymore. We do see a commonly used kettlebell type technique where it's done for high reps. Um, there isn't as much rotation demands on that one. And there is an early squat pattern found in that uh, exercise. The way they moved weight back then, which Harold Ansorange actually discussed this approach in how to properly bench, pre uh, properly bent press, which I will just kind of showcase the name of the book here as well. So you might be one to look into was the technique they used to move big weight was in use of a stake leg is what it was called. So the leg you were moving away from, the objective was to actually keep as much weight into that leg as possible throughout maintaining a straight leg and focusing more on lateral flexion of the torso to lock the weight out rather than squatting under their weight. So this is quite hard uh, to do and quite demanding on your flexibility. So the old time bed press is considered an honorable mention here. Things that I would consider working towards if you did want to do that. This is one of the problems with bent press training that I've seen over the years. And I've actually been, um, someone who has done it this way at the start as well is just starting with the bent press before developing certain, uh, flexibility or strength positions. So other progressions that would be smarter to start with here would be things like the side press. The side press is basically that rotating press action, 
but it's all through strength of the shoulder and triceps. So we're actually pressing it out. We're not getting under it, but the side press requires you to move with straight legs. So you have to master that steak leg action first before you go into the bent press if you want to do it the old time way. So I would be working towards a really strong side press. And I recommend that to students that want to learn the bend press first is get that side press super strong before you go throwing a lot of weight on your shoulders. So the final feat of range, which is the second honorable mention for today, uh, is the dragon squat. If you're not familiar with the dragon squat, you will be after this episode, but if you are familiar with it, it probably won't surprise you that it is at least discussed as an honorable mention. The dragon squat takes the pistol squat or also single leg squat, whatever you like to call it, and moves it into a position that requires seriously high demand of external rotation uh, and flexibility through the hip and the glutes. So the leg is coming behind the body as we squat down and the torso is rotating. So to do that, you do need a high level of flexibility through the hips um, and you need a crazy amount of strength. So my journey in hitting a dragon squat didn't take it to a level where I was just smashing reps out, but I was using it complementary to single leg squat training, uh, more specifically working it from a height, from a box height where I could actually get my leg around. Um, things to consider on obtaining a feat like this, obviously you do want that prerequisite pistol squat. You should be able to do pistol squats like nothing before you start wrapping your leg around your body. But really, the movement when we wrap that leg around the body is going to come to uh, that length and external rotation that we will be looking for on the side of the hip. So a prerequisite there would be something like a pigeon pose. You should have a really strong, flexible pigeon pose before really attacking a dragon squat as well. Also, just the lateral flexion strength of the torso with the adductors. So the adductors do need to have a certain amount of strength to actually maintain the lift. Whereas the pistol squat, you need that hip flexor strength. As you move into a dragon squat, you now need a lot more adductor strength to bring the leg into that position. So it's just such a more serious demand on the lower body, which promotes way more range of motion uh, through the hips. So if you are still with us, don't forget to subscribe for more unconventional strength and flexibility tips and videos. And if you have anything, you can leave a comment in the video and I will get back to you as soon as possible.